So I see folks saying hi from all over the place. So good afternoon from Colorado. It is lunchtime here, and my coworkers actually should be delivering lunch to my desk here any minute now. So I expect a chicken quesadilla, actually. So um, we will have just a couple of announcements, and then I'll pass off over to Neil. As you saw, I've got recording going. You can share this with your, your friends and coworkers later on. We'll send out a tweet when we get it posted to the event page, but it will be on the same page that um, the meeting information is now. So that join the meeting will change to a download recording. We are always looking for more folks to join and speak at our groups. We've got Neil here for the first time. So I've known Neil forever and now he's presenting to our group. So um, hopefully you've got folks in mind, whether it's yourself or a coworker or a friend that might like to present, let me know and we'll work with them on getting on the schedule, getting a topic that works for them and works for our group and um, get them started in front of the group. We have some upcoming events where we've got the Business Application Summit coming up. We've got, um, actually I leave on Sunday to go to the Business Application Summit. CRMUG Summit is later on this year and actually Inspire is right now in Las Vegas and Ignite is in September in Orlando. We have some additional upcoming meetings and that slide is missing and I apologize but they're all on the website. We've got um, in just a couple of weeks we've got Chuck Sterling talking about some analytics with your power apps and we've got some other um, meetings coming up with Jason Cosman and some other folks that you might know. Uh, so I invite you all to join. Now we've got Neil here who is a Scrum Master. He's also a fellow MVP. He does some online training events. And Matt Parks, I'm glad that you're here because you gave me my favorite Agile quote of all time. It's back in our Avanade days where he said we are as agile as possible within the waterfall process. And that's <laughs> my head. But hopefully that's, we'll get... That's to my goal in life, Julie, is to yes, hurt your head. Absolutely. So I'm glad with, I succeeded. With that, um, Neil, it's all you. Once we see your... Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for having me, Julie. I really appreciate the invitation to come and join the XRM virtual crew. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor, I think. Um, I've heard that you're a pretty seasoned group of veterans, you know, so uh, I've always been a little bit intimidated about presenting in front of you, but I had a rehearsal last week. Um, for those of you who joined, I just want to apologize. We, um, we had some technical difficulties, and I didn't realize I had jumped off the Skype call, and I finished my presentation. You were all very polite, and after about 45 minutes, I realized that um, I had lost you, and I'd been presenting to myself. Um, so this time, it's going to be great. There's going to be no te technical difficulties at all, I hope. So I want to remind um, folks while we're waiting for Neil's presentation to load, um, ask questions. So I see everyone is is being interactive in the chat panel, and that's great. I'll keep an eye on that and interrupt Neil as necessary for questions. But also, you guys can all take your, your microphones off of mute and interrupt and ask your questions in context. So I encourage you to be as interactive as possible. It, you get a better meeting that way, but considering last week, um, it also helps Neil to know that we're all still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, thank you. You're all set, Neil. I'm going to go back on mute and let you have at it. Great, thanks. Look, um, I was going to say good morning, everybody. It's uh, 5 a.m. here in, in Brisbane. It's probably slightly later than that where you are. I hope so. Um, it's the middle of winter here, and I hope it's also sunnier wherever you are as well. Uh, my name is Neil Benson. Um, I'm on a mission, really, to help every Microsoft customer and partner succeed with the Scrum framework. I want to help them implement Dynamic C65 using Scrum. I've been working with CRM software generally for about 20 years with Dynamics CRM and 365 since oh, 2006 um, and using Scrum since 2009. So coming up for 10 years with Scrum and I'm certified with both the Scrum Alliance and Scrum.org. There's two competing Scrum certification and training organizations. Um, I'm trying them both. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have received the MVP award um, since 2010. And like I said, I live in, in Brisbane and Queensland, so um, I'm based in Australia at the moment. Uh, those are all the different methods you can use to contact me. Um, I'm trying to get an Instagram account as well. Sorry that that's missing, but I, I need to get a 
trademark first and then to go through a process. Um, today we're going to cover a couple of things. It's the, the first of all, I want to cover the fallacy of requirements and why the requirement specification, which is normally the basis for a project plan, is a fallacy. And I'm going to walk you through a new technique, well, not a new technique, but a, a technique that I've put together based on other practices, which I call agile estimating and planning. Um, you're welcome to come up with a better name for it. Um, post something in the chat, that'd be awesome. Uh, Agile estimating and planning doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, so if you can come up with a better name, that'd be awesome. I'm going to start with my last requirement specification, which I wrote uh, 11 years ago, 2008. It was for uh, Debbie at Premier Medical Group. Um, she sent me an RFP um, that included the high level statement of requirements she wanted. Um, to replace an industry insurance workflow solution um, with, a, with a CRM based solution. Premier Medical Group helps people who've had accidents to, to get specialist medical reports uh, to support their insurance claims. Um, <laughs> they're, they're a very important part of the ambulance chasing industry. Um, Debbie's the operations director, so it's her job to chase the staff, who chase the doctors, who chase the lawyers, who chase the ambulances. And I was lucky enough that my little firm, Increase CRM, won the gig to implement Dynamic CRM 4.0. This is how long ago it was, 4.0 for about 300 users. Julie, I'm just going to pause there. Make sure you're all with me. You can hear me. You can see the slides. Yeah. Anybody? Things are going great. great. We see the old logo yes. in front of us, and we just had yes. a woman a minute ago. Great. Okay. Um, I hope there's not too much lag. I use a very rapid cadence on my slides, so hopefully it's keeping up. Um, we followed the, the good old fashioned sequential sure step methodology for those who remember it. So we just completed the diagnostic phase during our pre-sales engagement and we're ready to begin the analysis phase to produce what sure step calls the functional requirements document, the FRD. Some of you might still be using that, um, but uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't used sure step for a while. I still think you need silver light to, to, uh, to browse the sure step methodology. Um, the FRD took us about eight weeks to produce, and the result was a 600-page requirement specification, um, which at the time seemed like a lot. Certainly for, for the size of firm that we were, that was a, a really weighty requirement specification. We'd never done anything, anything quite like it. The reaction that we got from Debbie wasn't quite what I was hoping for. Um, she said the requirement specification was filled with jargon. Uh, she didn't really appreciate this. It wasn't even technical, but it was semi-technical. We used word, big words like entities and views and fields. Um, she thought some of the requirements were a little ambiguous, not quite specific enough. She felt that some of them were missing, even though the darn thing was 600 pages long. She thought there was um, uh, requirements missing from that. And she thought that some of our diagrams didn't make any sense to anybody. Um, th this is not one of the diagrams that I included, but it is a diagram that doesn't make a lot of sense to anybody. So why do we write requirement specifications? Um, What's the, what's the purpose? Well, you know, I guess they're designed to faithfully, accurately, and, and completely try and capture what users want and need from a CRM system. And to, to write all that down so that it can be perfectly understood by a software developer. And of course, we don't let software developers talk to users. Um, so it turns out that this is pretty hard. And, and you know, business analysts and software developers have been failing to faithfully, accurately, and completely capture user requirements for the last 50 years. Um, and as well as inventing funny cartoons that kind of take, um, uh, take the fun out of our own frustration, um, we've actually tried, as, as an industry, we've tried to invent new ways of describing requirements. Um, for those of you familiar with ISO, IEC, IEEE, 29148, you'll recognize that standard in the bottom right hand corner. It's also 24766 and 26702 and lots of other standards. Well, you get the picture. Um, I'm sure you've all got lots of copies of these standards sitting on your desk. Um, I'm sure they really help you. Um, but the problem with any kind of natural language specification is that the same words can be interpreted by different people in different ways. English is not a highly specific language. So even if I tell you exactly what I want, what I get might not meet my requirements. Um, there's a, a wonderful website. This is an example from tattoos, obviously, but there's a wonderful example um, of a website called cakerex.com where people have phoned a, a bakery 
and specify the type of cake they want and what they get is something completely different and it's it, you know it's so common that there's a whole website who collects pictures of these cakes and publishes those um, so natural language is not that good so what have we done to to counteract that well we've come up with some um, some structured uh, modeling notations or structured languages to use instead of natural languages uh, UML is a pretty popular one from Jacobson and, and those guys from I guess early 80s um, IBM took that and they, they come up with their version uh, the rational unified process um, we've got uh, Jacobson um, come up with use cases and then Alexander Coburn published his popular book on, on use cases which took it a lot further um, and but, but really to me they're just a bunch of circles with arrows and people pointing at them that still doesn't help me an awful lot um, understand the requirements certainly if I showed that to a user and said did this uh, does this context diagram sufficiently describe your scope and um, they'd take a moment to think about it and they might answer yes but they, I don't think they'd fully understand it um, in the early 2000s I found a guy called Martin Ould I really liked his uh, book business process modeling and I went and met with him and took some coaching on how to, to document business processes using role activity diagrams and here's a an eye bleeding uh, example of a role activity diagram <clears throat> again pretty good for describing business processes but uh, not you know, it takes a long time to explain that to a user and confirm it meets their requirements um, business process modeling notations a little better some of you might have used some of these I think if you're going to do any kind of workflow diagram I love to see people doing BPMN because at least it's a standard modeling notation we know what the different shapes mean they have a specific meaning um, whereas I've seen business analysts come up with um, workflow diagrams where uh, they've used the shapes, the standard shapes in completely non-standard ways, and they've used diamonds to represent actions and all sorts of crazy stuff. And um, of course, there's never a key or a legend with those things. Um, they just assume that you understand what's going on inside their head. Um, and if you think that um, you know writing stuff down is um, is a pretty bad way, and instead you want to draw some kind of model. Um, I can I can pretty much demonstrate that the drawing is even harder as well. Um, with a, a couple of good examples. Um, this is one of my favorites of some fan art. Um, you know, th these are people who know their subjects really well. Um, they're obviously very ta talented artists, and um, they have a they have a, they have trouble kind of um, faithfully capturing um, the subject of of their desires in an illustration. So what what we you know. If those are rabid fans, what chances a business analyst got of uh, drawing a picture of some kind of business process or a user's requirements? So, Premier Medical Group ended up scrapping our 600-page requirement specification. Um, Debbie and I decided to switch from SureStep to Scrum. Uh, I'd never used Scrum before, so this is a pretty bold move on both our parts. But I spent the last 10 years implementing CRM and 365 successfully, I'd say, using Scrum. Um, what I've really come to understand is that the real purpose of writing requirement specifications um, is to pretend that we know everything that our dynamics system needs to do so that we can draw up a Gantt chart um, of how long it's going to take. So by pretending we've got all the detail, we can come up with fancy diagrams like this um, and end up with um, Gantt charts like that where a project manager knows what I'll be doing at half past two on a Tuesday afternoon 18 months from now um, because all the tasks have been mapped out and assigned in advance. Anybody got one of those for their, for their current project? We have some folks um, typing. Let's see. Everyone seems to be afraid of their microphone except for you and me and Matt. <laughs> hey, Neil, so, this is Scott Jackson from London. Hey Scott, how are you? <laughs> I'm really good, mate. Yeah, no, um, it's great subject matter this, but uh, yeah, with the um, yeah the Gantt charts, yeah, a lot of our projects um, are run yeah that way. Yeah, some of them are, are pure agile, but a lot of them because of the constraints of working in you know financial industries, you know, we're expected to work in a fixed waterfall framework. Yep. So yeah, squeezing agile within the constraints of waterfall. Yeah, that's something I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, I'm working on as we speak, essentially. Yeah, there's definitely 
a, a transition to agile that lots of organizations go through and there's some kind of fragile scrum or fall hybrid thing along the way with um so i'm, I'm engaged in one of those projects right now where i've got to deliver they just call them iterations they're not using scrum but um they want me to deliver iteratively and then they're going to go with a four-week um systems integration test phase and then a six-week uh, UAT phase and to me that's not agile we should have been doing SIT and UAT in every sprint along the journey um, but you know I'm, I'm going to take these this customer on a journey and hopefully um, take them further into Scrum than they've ever been before it's definitely a transition um, let's take a look at um, at the techniques that I use for agile estimating and planning what I come up with at the end is a, is a roadmap rather than a project plan um, so now you know what I think of requirement specs. We can we can take a look at that. Um, there's five steps in the method that I use, and I'm right in the middle of this for uh, a customer. We had just had to finish a finished two-day workshop yesterday afternoon, and we're in step four. So I'm going to go away and produce the roadmap, um, but I'll walk you through the the process for a fictitious customer, and uh, you can see what it looks like. Um, First of all, I'd say we need to start with the, the right kind of planning team. I try and run my planning process with a cross-functional dynamics team of four or five people. That's hopefully going to be the same team that become the, the Scrum development team, but that's not always possible. I know in a lot of places we might be planning ahead of a business case, and that takes a long time to review and get approved. So it's not possible to form a, a cross-functional dynamics team that's going to go ahead and do the implementation. Um, but as close to that as possible, certainly um, what I try and avoid is having a single dynamics architect doing all the planning and estimating. We want to get a diverse set of opinions, lots of different uh, perspectives from people with different skills, not just uh, architecture and design skills, but business analysts, testers, developers, um, customization, configuration folks as well. Um, the process takes, uh, like I said, probably a day or two um, for a medium or large project. I've done it in a, just a couple of hours for, for a small project. First thing we do is we start off with user roles. Um, user roles were devised by a pair called Constantine and Lockwood. I have to admit, I haven't read their book from 1999, but I've read one of their, their papers. Um, and they defined a user role as a, as a collection of defining needs and interests, expectations, and user behaviors or what other people have come to, to call context, characteristics, and criteria. Um, here's an example um, from our fictitious um, project for a parks service um, for a state uh, parks organization. So we've got a park ranger is one of our user roles. Um, her context is that she drives around a thousand kilometers a week in a four wheel drive from ranger stations to a couple of different parks across the state using a rugged tablet. Um, so her context is very mobile, um, out of the office, um, probably patchy uh, internet as well. Um, some of the characteristics, I use characteristics to describe the, the frequency and the types of activities that my users are going to be doing. And maybe if it's important, I might also describe their um, technology proficiency. So um, I've worked on CRM projects where it's the first time that some groups of users are going to be using a computer. Um, that's always pretty scary. Um, other times we're working in a contact center where users are very proficient. They've got two or three monitors, they've got a headset, they're working on the phone, and they're, they're very used to switching between applications all the time, so much more computer savvy. So you capture that kind of information in characteristics. And then criteria is what, what's, what does success look like for this user role? Um, both from a, a job point of view and also from the system point of view. So for the park ranger, um, they're really concerned about um, safety and the standards of the assets in the park. Um, they're also uh, working with other agencies as well. So we've got um, you know the fire and, and gas and utility people that they work with as well. Um, and this park ranger wants speed, accuracy, and occasional offline access. Um, I don't always map out the context characteristics and criteria for every user role during the planning process. I might uh, sketch them out. So I just got. Um, the title and a, and a one-liner that describes the user role. And then I come back and fill these in um, before we start the implementation, just to give the actual development team um, a, a better sense of who we're implementing for. It's a pretty simple process to get those user roles. We start out with uh, a brainstorming session, then we organize them and consolidate and refine. So um, this is a pattern that we'll see over and over. I'm, I'm sure you've used similar patterns yourself in workshops too. 
Um, so Ralph has asked, um, why not a persona? Um, I've just had a network issue. Is everybody still hear me okay? Yep, yes, fine. Still here. Okay. Yes. So, um, um, so I have a good question. I would take um, personas as a, an advanced step from user roles. So a persona is where we take an actual named individual, and um, it might be a fictitious name quite often, and we flesh out their persona in a lot more detail than we do for a user role. That's definitely an advanced step you're, you're welcome to take. Um, it's not something I've done for all of my projects. I've done it in one or two, um, and that works even better than user roles, but it, it's not necessary for planning. So this is the result after the brainstorming session. We've got about 30 different potential user roles here. You can see some duplicates and um, lots of similar sounding user roles. I try not to I filter at this stage. I think it's All right. Maybe that was your hiccup. I'll go back and advance again. So I'm sh presenting slide 40. Yes, right now we see 39, at least I see 39. All right. I still see your list of modeling user roles. I can advance for you. I can see the slides. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's try that. Okay. Oh, hold on. There's a present now button. Maybe that's the button give, that give I need. Give a try. Yeah, let's got it. Brainstorm. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. I love Skype for business. Did I tell you that? Um, <laughs> you give me the perfect platform, I'll find a sponsor. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is the result from our uh, brainstorming session. Um, no filtering at this stage. I just had people calling out um, potential user roles. I wrote them on a post-it, slapped them on the board. Um, sorry, we're not sponsored by 3M, right? So it's a sticky note. Um, uh, that I use. And uh, the next step, we're going to um, organize those into similar categories. Uh, might look something like this. So I've got a, a category on the left for uh, external important people, then different types of park rangers, then different types of technicians, um, some financial people, um, visitors uh, to the park, and then a couple of third parties. I'm not sure whether they have an interest in the system or not. Um, so the user roles don't all have to be um, people we think will use the system, but these are people with a significant interest in the outcomes of the system as well. In this example, the Minister for Parks, who may or may not be called Matt Parks, um, he, uh, he or she probably isn't going to be a user of Dynamics 365, but they have an interest in um, knowing the state of the parks, maybe visitor satisfaction, those kind of things that the park rangers might be gathering in this kind of system. So um, it doesn't have, they don't have to be a user of it. Then we consolidated and refined those. So we ended up with about is it nine user roles in this project. Um, I just had a one-liner capturing their primary criteria. Um, so I didn't go for the full um, context characteristics and criteria for this project. Um, I don't have a Lego figure to represent each one of these, but of course I would do that because what's a good project without a bunch of Lego figures? Um, the next step in our process, now that we know our user roles, is to define our epics. <clears throat> if you've ever used user stories, you might be already familiar with epics, but an epic is really just a, a big, complex set of connected requirements, a collection of user stories. In my case, I use user stories um, to define what a user role wants or needs Dynamics to do. Um, there could be thousands and thousands of user roles in a project. My last project had about four and a half or 5,000 issues in Jira whenever I left. Um, and that was still with a year to go, so I expect them to come up with another couple of thousand. I use epics to represent a big cluster of related user stories. Um, I can't estimate that many small user stories, and you know, I can't. I don't know that level of detail about the system at this stage, so I stick at the epic level. And later on, we're going to refine those into more implementable user stories. So it's a very similar kind of pattern for defining our epics. We brainstorm, organize, consolidate, refine, and then the final step is estimation. So here's what we're going to try and get to. The, the green sticky notes represent the epics in our field service project. Um, and what I do is I try and consider all of the high-level requirements for each of my user roles. 
And we take them one at a time until we've kind of exhausted all of the potential epics for each of the user roles, then we move on to the next user role. Um, that way, we know that we've considered the requirements for all of the people who've got a significant interest in our system. Another way to do it, if you're going to use Jeff Patton's uh, user story mapping method, is to go through a business process. Um, I tend to use that technique when I'm the scope of my system is much smaller. For example, if I'm just implementing dynamics for case management for a, a small contact center, I'll think of the typical case handling process and I'll go from start to finish at a high level across that business process or a few business processes. Um, that way, at least I know I've got complete coverage of the main business processes that they want to support in dynamics. Or in this case, I know that I've got complete coverage because I'm considering each of the user roles in turn. Either way, I want to have some comfort that I've nailed everybody's high-level requirements and I haven't missed anybody or missed anything out. Um, this is a fairly simple project, so I've only got, what is it, 13 for 15 epics. Um, most projects are going to have somewhere 20, 50, 100 epics. Um, yesterday's workshop ended up with 70. Um, that's a 18-month program, probably, to deploy Dynamics for 2,000 users. So 70 epics is, is pretty typical. Um, you can see here I've got estimates. So I've, I've completed the brainstorming, organizing, um, consolidation, and I've gone ahead and estimated those. Um, and I thought I'd talk you through my estimation process as well, um, uh, which is part of um, understanding your team's velocity. And I'll come back to define velocity in just a moment. So estimating epics, those of you familiar with planning poker probably rep, um, recognize these cards. So planning poker is a gamified estimation technique um, that estimates items um, using, um, using some kind of cards. And the idea behind planning poker is, um, well, I'll, I'll come back to planning poker in a moment, but these are what we call story points. Story points are just an arbitrary unit of measure. I use it to measure complexity, which is a combination of the expected effort of implementing a requirement, and also it's uh, risk adjusted. And I, I combine those two into something I call complexity. So two requirements might represent, you know, I might, I might estimate that they've got the same effort to implement them, but one's got a higher story point estimate because it's risky. Somehow it's, um, I mean, maybe you're using new technology for the first time. Maybe I'm using an offline power app and I've never done that before. Or it's got dependencies or factors outside of our project, like a third party team or a third party piece of software or system that we've never depended upon before. We don't know what their responsiveness is like. So we're going to risk adjust. We think it's a 13, but we're going to go for 20 because uh, we're not sure how quick they're going to be. So if you've used planning poker, I use the estimates at the higher end. And I don't think most planning poker decks include 60, but I find that. Um, uh, it's it's a good um, step in the Fibonacci sequence between 40 and 100. I think that leap is too big normally, so I stick a, a 60 option in there. So planning poker, it's a gamified technique. Um, we discuss an epic. Each individual estimates the complexity of that epic. We do that kind of privately, um, independently, and without revealing our estimates to each other until everybody's ready to reveal their card. We all reveal at the same time. That way, my estimate doesn't influence anybody else's and nobody else's um, estimate influences mine. And then we discuss the highs and lows. Um, so Batman, who is our quality analyst, um, might think there's an awful lot of testing involved in a massive change to security roles. Um, Spider-Man is a bit more um, blase and he doesn't really consider the testing and he thinks it's a, a very small requirement he's gone for 13 because setting up new security roles is pretty easy for him as a, as a, a functional consultant so batman and spider-man would discuss their estimates um, either reach consensus or we'd all play again uh, until we do reach consensus uh, so to get started i recommend and um, the team finds a relatively straightforward epic and we call that our 20 point baseline and then we estimate everything relative to that baseline. So um, anything smaller than that, I'd call a 13 point epic. If it's twice as big, three times as big or bigger, then we go 20, uh, sorry, 40, 60 or 100. Um, anything bigger that you, know, you definitely think sounds like it's way more than five times as big as our baseline, it's therefore something more than 100. I'd try and split that epic up into two 
and uh, find a way to 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 reestimate that as two slightly smaller epics. So the next thing that we're going to do is imagine the development team or the Scrum team that we're going to form to deploy Dynamics. Um, unlike SureStep or a traditional team in Scrum, we're going to have a cross-functional team of analysts, architects, functional consultants, developers, integration specialists, testers, release managers. Everything that we need to go from an idea to working software is all those skills should be in that team. We're not going to have different phases where specialists come in and out. We're not going to have a design phase with the architect or architects um, producing design documents and then handing those over to a, a development team. We're going to have everybody working together. Um, so we, we need to imagine what that team is going to look like. Um, normally, it's between three and nine people um, in our development team. The product owner and the scrum master who completes our scrum team are counted separately from that. So between three and nine uh, people in the development team. We've got to, we've got to imagine um, how much work they're going to be able to do. So here's our um, scrum team. So we've got some client roles on the left-hand side. Um, these are people that my client is going to provide to the project team. And then I'm working for Microsoft Partner. So I've got my uh, development team there in the middle. Um, and I've got some rough estimates of their costs. So I know their running costs on the right-hand side. So I've got um, FTEs. Um, there's uh, 12.6 in total, and I know everybody's average working hours per week. Um, this is obviously a, a French project where 30 hours a week is the maximum. Um, but in this example, um, not everybody is dedicated to this project. They're not full time on this particular project. They might have some other responsibilities, but they're able to devote on average 30 hours a week to this project. Um, it is better if you are working full time, dedicated to your Scrum project, splitting your time between this project and uh, your support responsibilities or uh, some other projects or business as usual uh, is much less effective. Um, I said that uh, our average resource is $100 an hour and therefore our burn rate is $3,000 a week per FTE. Um, So we've estimated all of our epics. We're going to be doing 15, sorry, uh, two-week sprints. So we can uh, divide the, um, uh, we've estimated our velocity for that team is going to be 40 points per sprint. So we arrived at that number by looking at the baseline and saying, how many of those could we do in one sprint? In this case, we think that a team uh, of those 12.6 people could handle two 20 point epics per sprint. So our velocity, our estimate of velocity is 40. We divide the 573 by 40 and we come up with a, we round it up to 15. So it's going to take us 15 sprints. Each sprint is two weeks. So that's a 30 week project. We know that our burn rate is $3,000 a week. Um, so that's uh, $37,800 per week is our burn rate for the team. Uh, if we run that team for 30 weeks, we'll have a total project cost of just over a million dollars. And if we want to, we can break that back and say, looks like every story point is going to cost us nearly $2,000. Um, Sora is asking, how can we determine the velocity before the start of the sprint? Great question. And that, that's definitely one of the, the tricky parts of my, um, my method here, is that that is a wild-ass guess. It's based upon experience. Um, but what I try and do is refine that as soon as I can. So it's an assumption at the planning stage, and I want to I want to test that assumption as soon as I can. So I'll start the team for a sprint, probably two sprints, and test their velocity, and uh, then I can um, reproject my estimates from there. Um, so it's um, it's definitely a a weakness in this methodology is that. Um, we are we are having to take a wild guess on this team's velocity. Um, that gets much better with experience. But I, th I think most most dynamics teams could look at a set of requirements and roughly figure out you know the the velocity that they could deliver in a two week period. Um, particularly if you do it as a team, um, and maybe even use some kind of um, planning poker to arrive at a consensus for that. Um, you get a pretty good sense. Um, Scott wants to know, how do we estimate um, 
if some team members can deliver 50% more work? Um, good question, Scott. That's one of the reasons that I like using story points. Um, other teams use ideal days. I don't like using days because it fixes us on a time-based estimate. I try not to use time-based estimates. So I use complexity-based estimates. Complexity-based estimates take into account the fact that I, I often expect the velocity of a stable team to improve sprint over sprint. And they tend to just get better at working with each other. They tend to improve their knowledge of the system, of the customer's organization. And so I see the, and they, they build in automation into their processes as well. So I see their estimates, sorry, I see their velocity improving sprint over sprint. Um, I don't know ahead of time who in the team is going to do a particular piece of work. You're right that um, more junior team members might take longer and a more experienced team member uh, might take less time to implement a particular story. Um, and I think the story point estimates average that out pretty well. Um, Time-based estimates give us a much more fixed expectation of how long it's going to take somebody. And that's pretty unfair, particularly on, on junior resources. Um, so the, the complexity-based estimates kind of take that into account. Um, so yeah, Sergio is saying it's quite a big leap to go for story points rather than ours. Um, I, I agree. It's um, it's not always easy to, to get there. Um, I've used t-shirts um, very occasionally. I used them in yesterday's workshop because this team had no experience with planning poker. And I didn't want to introduce story points and have to explain how they were measure complexity. So we just stuck to t-shirt sizes. They were, go, I'm going to go away and, uh, and convert each t-shirt size into one of the numbers on that Fibonacci scale. Uh, and come back with that. So um, you can use t-shirts as well if that's easier for you. Um, Vangelis is asking about epics um, and product backlog items and story points with tasks and hours. Yeah, the good, good question. So when we get into delivery, um, some scrum teams like to break down their user stories into actual technical tasks, you know, um, creating an entity, adding fields, um, setting up a view. Those might be tasks in under your user story. I don't use tasks. Um, the data actually shows that the, um, this is from Rally, one of the software companies that makes an agile um, lifecycle management tool. Um, their data shows that the teams that use tasks are no more productive um, than teams who don't. And um, I find that the overhead of breaking down a user story and re-estimating all the tasks in ours gives me no advantage over just using um, user stories and tracking the progress of a user story and, and its status across my scrum board. Um, hi, Sergio. Yes, I'm not advancing the slides at the moment. Let's move on. Um, we've just got a few slides to go. So um, next step, uh, happy to take more questions at the end. Let's uh, keep, it, keep it flowing. Releases. So I'm going to ask my customer team to help me prioritize the epics into releases. Um, I can I can release software at the end of every sprint in Scrum. I often find that that's too frequent for my users. They don't want the system to change in front of them every two weeks, but I'm ready to go. At the end of every sprint, I've got production a production-ready um, release solution that has gone through um, user acceptance testing. It's gone through a rehearsal or staging instance, and I'm ready to deploy into production. Quite often, we don't actually release those. We hold them back. Um, we release maybe every couple of months. Um, we're, that's as often as users want to see new features because they have to go through training. There's a change in communication um, and a cost to those releases as well. So some customers want to release really frequently, others every few months. In this example, we're going to release, uh, it's about every five or six weeks, I think. So here, my um, customer has prioritized our um, epics over the course of the 30-week project into three different releases. So release one is going to be deployed in about sprint six, release two in about sprint 12, and release three after sprint 15, or in sprint 15. So it's a relatively straightforward project with just three releases um, and not an awful lot of gap in between those. Um, but the same uh, process works pretty well for, for large projects. So in the workshop I did yesterday, we've got I release every six months. They reckon it costs about three hundred thousand dollars to um, three to four hundred thousand dollars to release because of the training um, a burden. And we've got 
2,000 users across the state of Queensland to train. So um, we don't want to release every couple of weeks. Um, so now we know how many points of effort are in or complexity are in each release, and therefore how much it's going to cost for each release and how long it's going to take. Um, so that's a really critical component of our release map. And if I put all that together, um, we get a, a what I call a, a project plan or an agile project plan or a release mode roadmap, which is really just all of those components added up. So we've got the user roles at the top, the releases and um, epics in the middle, which kind of defines our scope, and the scrum team, and then all the estimates around who's going to be in the team, how fast they can go, and the estimates about how much they're going to cost down at the bottom. So no Gantt charts. Um, you can do this on a on a big whiteboard, or um, like I've done here is uh, you know capture the, those sticky notes in a, some kind of slides and present that. It's much less formal than a project plan. Um, Scott, you might have a hard time you know, convincing your um, your system owner to accept this instead of a Gantt chart if you're transitioning to Agile. But I think they'll find it it's much clearer. All of our assumptions are here, and we're not pretending that we know all of the requirements up front. We're not uh, pretending that we know how long everything is going to take. We have made some big assumptions, um, but those are visible and transparent, which is you know, a, a, a critical hallmark of a good Scrum project. So I'm going to finish up discussing the benefits and drawbacks of this approach, and then happy to take any more, any more questions. Um, so the benefits, first of all, um, why use this approach? I think it's much faster. Um, a planning team can start with a clean sheet of paper or a you know, brand new whiteboard and publish their first roadmap in just a day or two. That's normally much quicker than the months it takes of defining all the requirements at a sufficient level of detail, coming up with some kind of design, estimating all of those tasks and publishing all of that in a Gantt chart. That normally takes months. So we saved a lot of effort doing that. Um, we save effort, and that, that's critical because I've seen a lot of traditional projects where they spend a lot of time analyzing features and designing those features, and they never get implemented because we run out of time later on, and um, that feature gets cut. Um, so we just wasted all that analysis and design effort up front. Um, I think this is much easier. We've got a roadmap that's quite easy to understand. You don't need to be a project professional. You don't need to understand Gantt charts. You don't need to be one of those weird people who can make Gantt charts work really well in Microsoft Project. I'm not that good at that. Every time I try and adjust something or add an extra resource, it, it goes crazy. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of Microsoft Project in that regard. Um, I think this is much easier. We're just moving sticky notes around on a whiteboard. And it's very open, like I said, it's transparent where all of our assumptions are laid bare and can easily be refined once you know more about the complexity of the real requirements as you go to implement them and as you get to understand your team's velocity. Um, Tom's asking how long it takes. I do this in about a day or two, Tom, um, from start to finish. Um, I've just finished it for a customer here in, in Queensland and a two-day workshop from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon. I've still got to go through and, and uh, do the, the velocity estimates. So it's probably two and a half days. So a couple of days instead of months. Um, I'd be remiss to not point out the drawbacks. Um, I think there's a couple as well. Um, we've got a couple of big estimates in here. Um, we're estimating the complexity of each of the epics, and uh, those could be inaccurate. We're also estimating our team's velocity, and that could also be inaccurate. So we're laying estimate upon estimate, um, which could give us you know, quite a divergence from the truth. Um, I'd say that we want to test those estimates really quickly um, with a, maybe a proof of concept or phase one, whatever you want to call it, um, to figure out how accurate our estimates have been. And we might need to re-baseline from there. Um, uh, another challenge I have is that uh, we don't deliver all of the stories within an epic at once. And I had that challenge yesterday. So we had um, an, an epic called the Customer Loyalty Program. So this customer has got a loyalty program. They want to change that at some point in the next year or so. So we need to configure dynamics for today's loyalty program and then reconfigure it for the new loyalty program in the future. But we just had one epic called loyalty. So what we decided to do is to write two sticky notes and just break that epic up 
um, so that we could schedule it in different places. And it went from an XXL t-shirt to two large t-shirts. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so we can handle that. I do recognize that um, probably 80% of the stories within Epic get delivered and 20% um, kind of linger at the bottom of our backlog and may never get delivered. And that's okay because that allows us, that gives us a bit of a buffer because we've estimated it's a 40 point epic. We've only delivered 30 points of the stories within there and then we want to start a new epic. So that buffer of 10 points that we never delivered allows us to accommodate new stories that emerge during delivery. Um, so I find that that, um, that drawback actually works out pretty well for us in practice. And then the, the final challenge that I have is um, the project teams change, right? If, if this planning is being done months before delivery is going to start, it's very unlikely I've got the same team available when I go to start the deployment. Um, but the important thing is to have a cross-functional set of perspectives involved in that planning rather than just one architect who's going to write a spec and throw it over to a development team. At least even if the teams change, um, we've got a diverse set of perspectives and hopefully some of the team members can be consistent between the planning um, piece and the implementation piece. So that's it for me. I've seen a few questions come through in the chat. If I've missed any, um, and you want to call them out, happy to take any more questions. This has been great, Neil. I really appreciate it. Um, we have seen several questions. We've had a couple folks that have come off mute. Does anyone have any more questions for Neil while he, we have him here? This is Tim N, right? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. One of the challenges I have is, is data migration. And I wonder if you could talk about your experience in in using an agile approach to manage data migration? Sure, I, I treat data migration just like I treat any other epic and I, I might break it up a little bit. Uh, either, um, so for the project where data migration is a big component y yesterday, we had epics representing the data migration for each of the different source systems. So we had customers coming from a system called MRM, we had uh, purchases coming from a different system called Mars, and we had an epic representing data migration from MRM, data migration from Mars, data migration from XYZ, and we estimated each of those. Um, and I try and deliver those iteratively as well. Um, so I might have a first pass of just getting first and last names in and an ID, and then I might deliver iterations of, let's get the addresses loaded, now let's get um, more demographics loaded, now let's get some purchases um, loaded. Um, or some sales opportunities and deliver that iteratively too. So I don't treat data migration differently to um, functional um, stories. Uh, I try and treat it in the same way. Same for systems integration as well. Thank you. Anything else? Vangelis has asked about sprint planning sessions. <clears throat> so those would typically come later, um, just as we start the um, deployment project, I might have a week or two uh, of doing backlog refinement where I take the development team, we go through those epics, we refine those into a s set of user stories for the high priority epics that we're going to be asked to deliver first. So our product owner and the subject matter experts or business analysts who are supporting that product owner would take the development team through a week or two of backlog refinement to get our initial product backlog in good shape. And then we kick off the project with sprint planning, which is, you know, two to three, four hours of uh, detailed analysis and detailed story estimation um, for that first sprint. And if you're using tasks, then you'd enumerate your tasks at that point as well and come up with a, a bit of a technical plan for how you're going to deliver those um, first set of user stories in that first sprint. Um, so that would be the official start of your Scrum project at that point. Uh, thanks, Neil, for that. Um, yeah, exactly. That's why I asked the question earlier about hours with tasks. Yeah, yeah, that, that's when the task would, would get um, described um, during sprint planning. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, the, I've seen teams get fall into a trap with tasks and that they, they just have the same five or six tasks for every user story. And it looks pretty waterfall at that stage because all the tasks are 
analyze, design, uh, develop, test, deploy, and they just have the same tasks for every story and it becomes a bit of a meaningless exercise at that stage. If you're going to use tasks, they should be very specific to that user story about, you know, we're going to use a, a business process flow to satisfy this feature. This one's going to be a plugin. That one's going to be a, a flow, you know, be much more specific about the, the technical um, solution to the user story at that point. Yeah, I fully agree with that. What about the size of the user stories? The size of the user stories. Yes. Yeah. So I try and stick to the same estimation scale. Um, we saw the the upper end of the Fibonacci scale in one of the slides. So the bottom end, it's a half a point, one, two, three, five, eight, um, is what I use for user stories. Um, sometimes we have different scales for epics and uh, compared to the user stories, and that that can be tricky. Um, but I try and use a consistent scale. And there's nothing stopping you if if you want to use you know 200 400 600 for your for your epics you can keep going up up the scale you just need to find um a planning poker tool that supports custom numbering um there's a couple of them out there so yep um, plan, plan it poker um in the back of your mind when you are comparing the user stories with the actual time I, i'm sure you have something in the back of your mind Yes, um, I do. So um, when it comes to planning the team's capacity, so for I look at a sprint and go, oh, you know, Sergio's on holiday, Tom is on leave, and there's a public holiday in the middle of our sprint. So I figure out the number of working days that the team has got in that sprint, and then I convert that into story points. So I am doing a time to story point conversion for my capacity planning step. So I tell the team, hey, it looks like, you know, although our average velocity has been 200 points, um, uh, this sprint looks like our capacity is going to be 190 because of the leave and the public holiday. So yes, I am doing a, a point to time conversion, but that's based on real data. I try not to do that until I have a couple of sprints worth of real data to go on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, not every not every scrum master would, would do that and they would just try and stick with with uh, story points cool. do we have any more questions folks and on the story points thing neil so the so the largest one i think is normally 100 isn't it or something in the um on yeah the, on, the, on the estimation scale that i normally use but like i said there's nothing stopping you using um even bigger numbers if you need to but but I suppose it's it's in the hand of the uh, the team or or the management of that area to say right if anything is over it could, it, because it could okay you don't want to say it, it's ours right I, I get that that's right but if something is a really big epic so you know huge collection of work that is yep. realistically three months to do that. You know, yeah, I don't want someone doing a 60 day estimate for a feature or for an epic because I want that yeah. broken down. But yes. so I kind of need to give guidance to say, you know, you know, a hundred point estimate would be something like, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say you know, six weeks work. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're sort of, you yeah. know, you're messing with the whole thing, you know, so I don't know if you've got well, any um, counsel there. We, we, we are, when, when we, when we try and baseline our, our uh, assumed velocity, we are saying that this team within a two week sprint could deliver in my in my example there it was 40 points worth of work so we are saying that you know that's pretty much tying story points to time um uh there's there's 10 working days in two weeks so what we're saying is we can deliver four points per day um but what i'm saying is the that that story point is not just effort on average it um we're going to deliver four points per day. Some days will be more, some days will be less because our story points also take into account risk. Things, things that are unknown, um, technical complexities are going to rise, risks that we kind of foresee working with third parties or, or new technology. Um, but also I would expect, I would hope that the team is going to start delivering more than four points per day. After six months working together, we might be at five points or six points per day because we've mm. our, we've improved our velocity through automation and uh, you know just teams 
who go through that um, forming, norming, storming, performing um, uh, cycle get better. Um, so, yep, um, I w definitely wouldn't leave it as, oh, that's going to be three months. That's a thousand points. That, things that are, you know, if one, one requirement is 20, that's probably reasonably accurate. Things are at a thousand. All you're saying is, I haven't got a clue. Yeah, um, so, yeah, definitely right. try and refine that big, massive, even bigger than Epic. Um, down into something that's a hundred points or less. Like I said, I try and I try and keep my biggest epics within five uh, x of my baseline. So nothing more than five times bigger than the baseline. Thanks. And there's no talk of contingency um, or estimating uncertainty or yeah, in the way in this method, is it? There's not in terms of because. A lot of my estimates, well, all my estimates, basically have to do waterfall front up, yeah. And so, yeah, we're running normally at plus minus twenty percent, yeah, you know, things like that. But, um, but there isn't really at this this stage, is it? Um, in yes, in so much as the estimates are risk adjusted. So we might have a, a an epic there that's thirteen points. That's reasonably small. You know, that that's that could be just a few user stories. Um, and there's not much risk like if it's you know basic account and contact configuration or, or a sales process you know we've done that i would like to think as a dynamics professional you've done that lots of times before um you know how to do that you know the effort involved and you know that there's probably not that much risk because the requirements sound reasonably well defined the sales process somebody's got in their head uh, seems like they know what they're talking about yep i can estimate that as 13 i'm not going to risk adjust it um if, if I thought that they were going to change their sales process or it sounded pretty uncertain, um, I would risk adjust it. And that's where my contingency would come in. Now my, it's 13 points of effort, but I'm going to risk adjust it to 20 because it sounds like they, they're unsure of their requirements. So um, that's where my contingency comes in. It's just a way of risk adjusting it. Okay, thanks. Great questions, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you're paying attention. You've been trying this stuff out. It's awesome. Yeah, this has been great, and I really appreciate as someone who sits on the um, project team and estimating that we've got a good collection of developers here that are interested in participating as well, because that makes the project so much better when we have the estimators that represent the different interests in the project. That's awesome for me to see. Yeah, have you ever have you ever been the developer in a project and like somebody has handed you the the design specification, the project estimate, and gone here, implement this. Oh, no, but I'm usually the person that does that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, stop doing that, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> so with Get that, I will thank you, Neil, for your, your time and your presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining us and for attending and all your, your questions and your interactivity. Um, as always, reach out to us if you need anything. And um, you guys all take care. I'll be posting the recording hopefully later on today. Thanks, everybody. I'll hopefully see you at the Dynamics 365 User Group Summit in Phoenix in October. Um, I'm not going to make it to the Business Application Summit. I'm not presenting at, um, at Summit, but I uh, would love to meet you there and, uh, and buy you a beer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care.